Hey everyone, I am Dada Groover with The Inspired Writer, and today I want to talk with you about motivation. I believe that is a big issue for many, if not all, writers at some point or another, for all creative people for that matter. Uh, musicians sometimes have that issue. I did play music professionally when I was a teenager, uh, into my 20s, and then on and off throughout my life. That was 20s were a long time ago for me. Anyway, um, and you know, sometimes motivation was an issue. I've always loved playing. You can see my guitars, my basses are on the wall. They're not just for show. I actually do play them. Yes, I love it. It helps me uh, with my writing. It's part of my writing, the way I see it. Um, that's a whole other subject that I've talked about in other videos. But the motivation uh, and lack thereof can be a real problem for writers. It can be a real problem and frequently is. So today I'm going to give you some tips and tricks that I believe will work. Don't forget to click that subscribe button and ring that little bell so you'll be notified of any future videos coming out as they come out every single week because I am I'm dedicated to this. I really am. So motivation and lack of it. What happens? So here's I can share with you what my experience is and I'd be willing to bet that some things are going to resonate with you and not necessarily everything and I believe not that I believe I know everybody's somewhat different in this regard. It's like some things that might motivate you might not motivate someone else and some things that distract you because a lot of times we you know we talk about motivation but it's really about distracting. It's about you know I'm working on my book and somehow I researched something. I had to research something which we have to do sometimes and YouTube popped up right or I, I searched YouTube for something perfectly bona fide of course sometimes we need to do that and when YouTube came up I saw something that was really interesting and YouTube has very smart algorithms that get you to watch more and more and more of their videos and that's why so many people refer to YouTube as a black hole because they just get sucked in oh this video is only 10 minutes long and this one's only 15 minutes or this is only seven minutes long whatever it is and or they don't look at the time they just say oh that's such a cool thing YouTube knows they're algorithms know what you are looking for. They don't know exactly, but they have a pretty damn good idea and you get sucked in. So therefore, my first tip around motivation is use three hashtags together. It could be three at signs. It could be anything like that. But I use three hashtags and when I'm writing and I'm this is when I'm doing a first draft, when I'm doing a revision, doesn't matter where I am, I will put three hashtags when I need to research something. I need to find out, like I'm referring to something that happened in a certain time period and I need to know, well, did that really happen at that time period? This is very important stuff. It's very sloppy when a, re when a writer does not do their research. The readers notice most of the time and you lose a lot of credibility that way. Um, so. What I do is I put the hashtags down there, which means I need to go back at a certain point and do all my research. And I do all my research at the same time. And I'm focused on doing research. I'm not going to get sucked into YouTube. And yes, you've already guessed, I have been sucked into YouTube. I'm not immune. So I have the hashtags. And as I'm writing along and I'm trying to think of something uh, I can add it later, but I put three hashtags in to signify there's a gap or there's something to research or something that I need to go back to. Um, I write in Scrivener, which is a whole different subject. I write in Scrivener and with a quick shortcut key, when I do the three hashtags, it makes maroon text that's indented. So I, I scan my document. I immediately know what needs my attention to go back to. 
So it's really easy. I also use three asterisks together when I have not come up with someone's name or I need to think of a name or I can't remember a name. Whatever that is, the three asterisks will do that. And the same thing, I might do it the same pass I'm doing all the research or I might do it at a separate pass and it's totally fine. So that really helps with motivation because uh, I've talked to people that say, yeah, I have a hard time getting motivated. I talked to them about what they were doing, how it happened. They got sucked into browsing the internet or Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or whatever it is. Name your poison. And I'm not saying social media is poison, but yeah, it, it can be to the writer. It can completely uh, distract us. So what they think is motivation or lack of motivation is actually just distraction. So that's the first point. And notice that. Notice that without beating yourself up like, okay, I got distracted and I need to do something like, oh, maybe I'll use those three hashtags that Dada was talking about. I won't tell you, I won't say I told you so. Or use the three asterisks for names, whatever. Uh, it's, a, it's a great little tool to have. Next thing that I think is really important is to um, recognize patterns. When you recognize the patterns that will happen, it's going to give you a lot of power. And by pattern, so at last week in the video, I talked about uh, the sine wave, right? How we can do a sine wave and it might be an uneven looking sine wave. Sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes way down. It's the self-perception, our perception of how good we are, how effective we are as a writer, and how good we are or how good our work is, right? So whatever book you're writing, whatever project you're working on, you may think, oh, it's awful. And that might be unrealistic. So you're at the bottom of this, that sine wave and you're thinking, oh, this is really awful. And it's actually this good but you're thinking it's worse than it is. And then over time, it starts, oh yeah, it's not too bad. And it's and, and then at a certain point, it's somewhat accurate. Your perception is somewhat accurate. And then your perception may go above where it's, it's not quite as good as you think. I believe this is completely natural and normal. It's a pattern. And again, it's not an even sine wave. It might be a little down, a little up. It might have a dip there. It goes up, goes way down, goes a little bit up more back so it goes all the way down to the basement and it happens I believe to all of us if you think your writing is awesome and you always think your writing is awesome there's a good chance you will never work to improve it hmm. and this I believe at least for me is one of the joys of writing because it's about improving our work and you can improve that work as much as you want to. However, if you think your work is already amazing, if you think your work is already incredible, then there's really nowhere for it to go and you're not gonna be motivated to take it better. So what happens to take it better, to make it better? So what happens is when you get to a certain point, right? And you think it's it's way up here. It's like, I don't need to go any farther. That's not good. It's not gonna get any better. And there's no need to make it better if it's already as good as it can be, right? Or you're at the other end of that curve and you're at the bottom of it and you think, this is crap. This is terrible. Uh, this is no good at all. That's not good. And then a lot of times <clears throat> people will get discouraged. Or if you say you've worked on something for a thousand hours, right? You've, that's a lot of work. You might get to a point where you think this is the worst thing I have ever written. This is the worst thing that anybody's ever w written. It's useless. And like I said before, it's actually below. You're thinking it's worse than it actually is but you put all this time into it, it can get very discouraging. Now, if you're understanding that sine wave, and again, it's an uneven sine wave, if you're understanding that it's natural to go up and down, it's, all right, I'm just at the bottom of that sine wave. And my wife helps me with this. I mean, it's great if you have a partner who understands these things. She's also a writer. And he'll say, like, I don't know the value of this story. She goes, yeah, you're at the bottom of that sine curve again, aren't you? And I said, yep. She calls it a sine curve, I call it a sine wave, doesn't matter what you call it, but it is really 
important to know that that pattern exists. If you recognize the pattern, it will have less power over you. It will be less effective in throwing you off track and affecting your motivation. Another pattern that I want to talk about is the pattern, I call it the midterms. Do you remember being in school and having midterms come up, high school, college, whatever it was? I hated midterms. I hated them with a passion because they were very important. They were things that I should have been studying for. And yeah, I always passed my midterms, uh, not necessarily with flying colors. I won't get into my school history. That's a subject for a whole nother set of videos. But I hated them because you're still not done. You're just halfway through that school year. And you got to do these incredible amount of tests. And, uh, you know, the midterms could last for days. I did not like midterms. Obviously, they bring up a lot of lot in me. You can tell that, right? So, midterms in terms of writing. What do I mean by midterms there? So, when you start a book, you do your first draft. I don't know about you. I love doing that first draft. I sit down for four days. I got nothing else going on, and I do my first draft. I can do a first draft in four days, and... Then I start my revision process, which might go on for a year. That's my strategy for writing. It works very well for me. I'm not saying it has to for you. That is another subject as well. But after you do that draft, then at a certain point before you get into the book, like you're into the characters, you're reliving the scenes, and that is very exciting. That's my favorite part of writing the book. When I'm, when I'm, I understand my characters. I know how they're motivated. I know what they want. I know where they're going. I know what their inner goals are, their needs. I know what their outer goals are, their wants. What do they want? Who's getting in the way? How's that happening? That's fun. It's still work, but it's, it's very fun work. In between that first draft and that part that I call fun are these midterms. And they're not necessarily fun, but they are necessary. And that's why a lot of books lag in the middle. You've probably heard other writing coaches talk about lagging in the middle. And that's not a fun thing when your book lags in the middle. I've read a lot of books that lagged in the middle. And I believe it's because the writer gets in that midterm and they just want to get out of it. I think it's something we have to slug through. You just have to go through that midterm. It's not necessarily fun, but it's an, uh, a necessary part of writing your book. And if you look at it in the sense that you will get to that goal of getting to the fun part and creating a book that you're not only going to have uh, a lot of fun writing, other people will also enjoy reading. You may have heard me talk before in one of the other videos about what I call layering. So layering is a very fun way to write where, okay, I've done my first draft, right? That's the first layer. And as opposed to, I got to finish my first chapter and get it perfect. And then I go to my second chapter and get that perfect. This applies to fiction writing. It applies to how-to nonfiction. And it applies to memoir. It applies to every kind of writing there is, right? Every kind of book writing. It applies to essay writing. Uh, it applies to all kinds of things, even poetry, I've written a lot of poetry. I love writing poetry, and I do it in layers. Sometimes the whole poem will come to me. I put it on paper. It's done. There's nothing else to do. Other times, I do that first layer. I want to say one of the people I learned this from, I am a bass player. That is a bass right there. You might see different bases in my videos because I, I mix and match them. Uh, Paul McCartney, who is one of my musical heroes, genius songwriter, a musician, singer, and so on. One of the things that I learned from him, besides a lot of things about bass, is he would always layer. He would start out songs that were, um, for example, one of the, I think, I, 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 I want to say, I, I don't have time to research, I'm not going to put my three hashtags and go research this, but I do believe that the most covered song, in other words, the most sung song of somebody else's 
in history is yesterday. Yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. Nice song. You know how he started that song? He woke up with that song in his head. He, he dreamed it with exactly that tune. And his first layer was scrambled eggs. What I'm going to have for breakfast is some scrambled eggs. I'm serious. I am not making that up. I heard him say that in an interview. So I know, coming right from the source. He did not have the words to that. And then the words fell together, layer by layer. So that's layering method. I think it's a great way to do virtually anything in terms of writing. So you go through the midterms. You don't have to get it perfect. You have as much fun with you can. You might slog through it the first day or slug through it if you prefer that word. And uh, then the second time through, you're just adding to what's, ev what's already there layer after layer. It's a fun way to write and it helps the motivation when you think oh, I've got it, especially when you're in the, in the midterms, when you think I've got to get this right, I've got to get this perfect. That's where we can get thrown off track. So layering really helps with that motivation. Knowing the pattern for the midterms, that also can help with motivation. Now, one thing that I do, which you may have judgments about, I don't care if you have judgments about it. But one thing that I do is I treat myself. I always have something that I would like to do, something I would like to, whatever it could be, something I want to watch with my wife. We have our together time. That's, that's apart from that, something that I would really like to do. It could be anything. It's like, yeah, I want to work on my, I'm a photographer, right? I used to be a professional. It's now, uh, it's a hobby for me. I love it. I love doing it. Sorting my photos, working on my photos, for example, after a hard day. That's a lot of fun for me. Does not have to be like that for you, but what would you love to do? And then you hold it over yourself. Like I will do that after I've written two hours or three hours or after I've shot this video, like I get to, I'm going to treat myself. I get to actually, I'm going to sort some of my, med my uh, media, some of my photos after I shoot this video. That sounds ridiculous. I know, maybe to some people, or it makes total sense to you, but it makes total sense to me because I am giving myself a reward doesn't matter if you think it's a reward or not. For me, yeah, that is a reward. That's something that's fun to do. I really enjoy doing it, and I'll do it after I've done it. There were several other things today that I also wanted to accomplish. This happens to be uh, the last of those things, and that's a reward. So what rewards will you give yourself for writing after a certain time. If there's no reward, no motivation, yeah, and you might just really enjoy writing. I love writing. I love writing. And this brings me to the last and perhaps the most important part of motivation around writing. And I've mentioned this before in other videos, but having a time to write is so important. It is so incredibly important. Now, for me, I can get distracted by YouTube. I can get distracted by other things. I can get distracted by life. I can do fun things. I, you know, I, I'm running a business. My writing is a business. My teaching is a business. And there's certain things that have to be done, certain things that I can get distracted by, looking down the road, making plans. All those things are great, but I don't want to ever sacrifice my writing for them. You don't have to make that decision. But that is definitely my decision. And when I wake up, I meditate for whatever time I feel like meditating. This morning, I meditated for almost two hours. That's one of my longer uh, meditation times. Typically, I'll meditate for half an hour, 45 minutes, maybe sometimes an hour. I never put a time on it. Whatever I meditate for, that's my time. And I pray. Every day, I pray. And for both of those things, that's my spiritual time. I don't put any limit on that at all. Yeah, typically, it'll be an hour, hour and 15 minutes maybe. But it's, you know, that's pleasure for me. It really does me a lot of good. It gets me very inspired to write. And yeah, and that can be very motivating as, all, as well. 
what happens is I wake up, I do that, and then I start writing and I write every day until 9 a.m. So for example, I might wake up at five o'clock and my spiritual practice might go until 6.15. And that means I've still got two hours and 45 minutes to write. Then I also will have time during the day to write, maybe. Depends on the day, depends on how much I have going on. Usually I'll find some time to write. What I have found from experience is that, uh, that those early hours in the morning, they are my most productive time, whatever I'm doing. So for example, my wife and I, we do live events. We do live uh, teaching events. And on those days, there might be a lot to that has to happen. And after my spiritual practice, I'll just jump right into preparing for that event, which is fine. And then I'll plan to write during the day. And, you know, at breaks or whatever, my wife's on stage, I'm off stage, I got an hour here and there. And I, I usually am pretty good about that. But there are days when I plan to write and I just, what can I say? Other things get in the way. It happens. It happens easily. If I have those few hours in the morning, and sometimes it might be three hours, sometimes it might be four hours, I don't have to stop at nine o'clock. If I have something else going on, great, but I might write until 10 o'clock. I might write until 10.30. Sometimes that happens too. I could write, sometimes I could write four to five hours in the morning. And then if I have time to write later in the day, I might do it, I might not do it. If I don't, there's no harm done, I haven't missed out, but I have that time that I've already put in and that really helps with motivation. Like I said, a lot of motivation is actually distraction and or, or rather not being distracted. That's I think you probably knew what I was saying there, but uh, if you focus on what you have to do during the day, that's awesome. And, you know, if you're extremely disciplined, you're better than I am because I am a very hard worker and it's really easy for me to get distracted by different things. And I'm going, oh, I got to do this and I got to do this. And sometimes that needs to be done. Somebody on our team, um, we have a lot of people helping us with what we do, uh, with doing our work in the world. And sometimes people need stuff. They need things done and taken care of. And that can sometimes get me off track and leading into other things. But if I've had that morning time, it is all good in the best possible way. So I hope that was helpful. I've heard other people say, just have a Pinterest board, that'll motivate you. Boy, that's not my thing. You know, it's like, yeah, I tried, I did try. Um, things like that, or they put motivational statements up in front, or, uh, you know, one thing I will say I have heard from other people that I do agree with that I will leave as a last a motivational item is write down what you would love for people to say about your book. What would you most love to have somebody say? What would you most love to read in a review about your book? And that can be very, very motivating. If you don't have a clear goal as far as your, your writing, as far as your book's concerned, what you want it to be, then it can be harder. I know I want my book to change people's lives. And I know that to do that, I need to work very hard at writing in terms of the characters, in terms of what the book is saying, all these things. And if I didn't have that goal, like if I just wanted to write books, um, that made money, that'd be like, that. Okay, you know, I'm just not interested. I'm not, yes, I would love for, I've said this before, I would love for my books to make lots of money. I'd love to become a multimillionaire through my writing, but that is so not my goal. And if I became a multimillionaire uh, through writing and it, I wasn't changing people's lives, no, I just, I would not want to do that. That would not be a, a happy outcome for me. So I'm very fixed on what I want from my writing. I believe that you will also have that successful result in your mind in terms of what you want if you are clear about it. So it's important to be clear. What do you want from your writing? What do you want from your work around that writing? What do you want that result to be? 
Hope this was helpful. Thank you very much for watching through to the end. If you click the subscribe button and the little bell, I know I sound like a broken record, but it will notify you of videos that come out and it will make me very happy. So that's important too, right? That a Groover here. Take care.